first slide in any presentation that I give is about what's happening, uh, my understanding of what's happening in science right now. Uh, so 2011, a few things happened, middle of my PhD, where I realized um, not everything is going according to what I expected science to be. Uh, so we had you know, false positive psychology, the BEM uh, JPSP paper. Uh, and since then we've started doing a lot of replications and we've had um, increasingly more and more disappointments, not just with psychology, but uh, in other fields as well. So you can see, um, what is, okay, yeah. So you can see from all, all the sciences in medicine, the, the sciences stop working, uh, chemical research. Uh, the more recent ones, you know, cancer research is broken. So there's this mass replication effort in cancer biology. Very, very disappointing findings. Uh, only uh, can start 18 out of 50. Uh, and then out of the 18, uh, about uh, nine are replicated. So nine out of 50, that's not a good record for something like cancer where people can you know, get hurt and die. But some people have said, yeah, but this doesn't affect things like physics or mathematics or computer science. So this is recent. This is just like from uh, 2020, August. Uh, seems like it's also affecting things that are as close to math as you can imagine. So also in computer science uh, and even physicists, <laughs> so quantum mechanics is suffering replication reproducibility crisis. So we have to talk to students about this. We have to uh, invite them to help us uh, fix this. And this is more or less what I've been trying to do at University of Hong Kong. Um, when I go and I talk about these things, I get a lot of pushback. Uh, what are you talking about? This is not happening. We've been doing this for 40 years. So um, why, why are you saying that there's something wrong? I'm not saying that there's something wrong. I have my own intuitions regarding what is happening. My summary of this whole thing is a little bit like this slide over here where, you know, where we're talking about uh, the environment. We're talking about uh, green, uh, you know, green cities, livable cities, renewable energy, all sorts of things that are good. And then occasionally somebody comes up and says, but what if all this global uh, climate change is a hoax and we created a better world for nothing? So I feel like it's the same thing with open science. Um, we're talking about all sorts of things that need improvement, like data sharing, opening up transparency, and so forth. So what if this replication crisis is a big hoax and we create a better science for nothing? Let's create a better science, regardless of where you are uh, with this thing. Um, my personal take on this is that we are in grave need of a credibility revolution. Uh, and I'm working with many others on open science. Um, emphasizing uh, collaboration. So I used to work on my own uh, in my, uh, me and my advisor, me and one or two collaborators. And if, we, if it will be just uh, up to us, it will take decades uh, to try and address this crisis or really improve. Uh, but if we work collaboratively, all of us around the world, then there's a real chance that we'll be able to uh, um, do something about this. But if it's just people like uh, my level and above, like assistant professor, tenor track and all this, there's not enough of us, uh, but there's, you know, the big hope for me is uh, students or an early career researcher starting from undergraduate through master's, PhD, postdoc, uh, you have the power to make a real difference and I'll show you how. Um, this is what I decided to do when I was in Maastricht University. I understand one of you is going over there soon. Uh, one of the nice things about the Netherlands is that it's really emphasizing things like uh, uh, open methods, uh, open science, and trying to uh, emphasize trustworthiness, uh, reproducibility, replicability. So these are the things that I decided for myself. I feel like um, any one of us should take a year or two to kind of think about what's happening right now in science and what do I want to do about this. So uh, a lot of replications, preprints, uh, doing power analyses and all that simplicity. So simple models, main effects, and maybe one uh, two-way interaction, but uh, not much beyond that because we know now that we need uh, large samples or very elaborate designs to be able to detect anything. Uh, findings are findings and all effects and all that. But the most important thing, of course, is this uh, full transparency, not just sharing all the materials, the data and the code, but also sharing all your decisions about exclusions and everything from the beginning uh, to, to the end of the life cycle. 
At the beginning, it was just me and a few other students at University of Hong Kong, and you can see that by now we have, uh, I've, um, through my courses, we've had 300 uh, undergraduates conducting replications and extensions in my classes. Uh, to them, I added uh, 30 guided thesis students. So with my students, I only do pre-registered replications and extension or pre-registered meta-analysis. But since then, uh, we've had 50 uh, early career researchers from around the world, hopefully uh, some from Israel uh, soon. But you can see uh, they're, they're from everywhere. I think you'll recognize some of the names here. Um, so um, yeah, uh, some of them are peer reviewers. So Neve Help, uh, Lean Help. Uh, and then we have lead, lead authors where they come in they take over the students' replications and extensions as lead authors, first co-author, and I'll show you what that looks like, and then they help us bring this to publication. How many did we do in the last three years since I joined University of Hong Kong? We've done about 100 of those, 72 are completed with data, uh, complete manuscripts ready for submission, just for you to come in, lead, verify, and, and make this uh, journal submission worthy. And you can see that uh, our replication rate is a little bit higher than what you can typically see in the social sciences and definitely in the, in the what's called the hard sciences, the exact sciences. Um, so I focused on classics in judgment and decision making. I think a lot of the things that are discussed in the uh, DMEP uh, seminar uh, that you, um, a big group here in Israel does judgment decision making. Um, and the replication rate is, is encouraging. So it's about 70% and about 13% uh, is inconclusive or, or mixed. Some things work, some things didn't. But more than you know, the, the support for classics in judgment decision making, I want to re-emphasize that this is done by undergraduate students in Hong Kong. So at the beginning, when I set out to do this and I said I'm a first year assistant professor at University of Hong Kong, I'm thinking of doing these replications uh, with the undergraduate students on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and, and prolific, most people who replied were not very enthusiastic about this and uh, thought that we uh, will fail. So beyond the classics of judgment decision making, replicating, just think about it. This is, this is undergraduate students doing real science and contributing to the, um, to the community. And it's not just replications, they also have important extensions that have uh, additional insights. Uh, we've done, so what, where is the 100 if we only have uh, 72 here? Uh, we've also done register reports. I don't know if you're familiar with register reports, but increasingly this is something that we uh, do more and more. I'm trying to shift everything towards register reports, but obviously if I run these replications and extensions in one semester with undergraduates, there's no time for registered reports, but I'll talk about, I'll talk about what registered reports are. This is generally our, um, this, our structure, how we do things. So everything, of course, is with pre-registrations. So they do the Qualtrics uh, that tries to imitate, replicate uh, the, the classics. Then we produce random data sets using Qualtrics. It has this feature of producing random data sets. They write the code to analyze the random data sets. And then they write the pre-registration. Then we have external uh, feedback. Uh, I go on Twitter, uh, people like Niv and, and, and others, um, go in on our Google Docs and help the undergraduate students do better with re their replications. Sometimes we get the original authors to come in and comment. So just imagine you're an undergraduate and you're doing a second year undergraduate and you're writing something in a Google Doc and then the person who, whose work you're replicating comes in and gives you a comment. It gives them a real sense of, you know, like they're doing something really important. And, and it's amazing to see this community uh, work together. And then they have one week to revise based on all the feedback. I go and I pre-register and I do the data collection. Uh, finally, I give them the data sets. I just wanna say that for each project, we have two different teams working independently. So they peer review each other, they analyze the data set separately and so forth. And finally, uh, it gets to the point where after all the external uh, feedback and peer review, we have an APA style submission ready manuscript that ideally we can just send into the journal, but we don't, and uh, this is where you come in. So you're invited to come in and take these reports and help us submit these to uh, the journals. And this model seems to work at the beginning. I wasn't sure if this is gonna make it to publications, but just in 2020, uh, as you can see, the model is 
All of these uh, first authors are early career researchers, maybe like you. So you come in and then it's shared co-authorship with all the students who are underlined. Then the teaching assistants, so everybody gets credit. If you were involved, you can come in and then me trailing in the back. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of other preprints. So out of the 100, we still have about 50, 60 of these uh, that are waiting for you to come in and take the lead. Uh, data collection is over, zero risk, you don't have to, so you know exactly what the results are. It's just for you to help us to bring us to uh, journal submission, and of course, add your own analysis or your own insights uh, on that. So open invitation, both about this and everything that I'm gonna show later in the uh, future. So this is an opportunity for you to join the team. Even if you don't want to uh, lead this kind of project, we've created a lot of guides, templates, um, a lot of resources for the community. If you come in, first of all, you can use this as you want in your own projects, but if you come in and you contribute something and you add your name and you say what you contributed, you're a co-author. So this is how the open science community works. If you came in, you contributed, it doesn't matter what level you are. Uh, if you con contributed something meaningful, then you're a co-author and then we submit this all together. So uh, this early career researcher student community is having a real impact on the uh, open science um, and science overall uh, community. So if you wanna join us, this is, this is the link. You can go on this link and, and have a look at, at this. Um, there's lots of hidden slides. I didn't say this at the beginning, but you can download these slides over here and there's uh, the first slide also has all the links. So you can have a look at these uh, you know, at home uh, in, your, in your own time. Go over the links, uh, see all the hidden slides and then learn a little bit about what we're doing. Um, so this is kind of like a broad, very fast introduction to what I do with uh, students, early career researchers from around the world. And I'm really eager to find somebody in Israel that would want to work with me and join this uh, incredible uh, team. It's, it's, uh, it blows my mind to see how, these, how they work. When you open everything up, everything is Google Docs. Everything is shared on Twitter in almost every stage. It's, uh, it's amazing to see that the impact of, of these young researchers and I'm very happy to be part of this, uh, this kind of team. Okay, so that's putting all the open meta science uh, aside. We'll come back to this occasionally. Now I'm gonna focus on uh, free will and agency. Some of it repeats a little bit what I've done in 2014 when I visited here, but not too much, I hope. So uh, 2,500 years ago is when we started doing some research on free will. And then we've got these two very important figures, uh, Apicolus and uh, Democritus. Um, so they had very different uh, takes on free will. So uh, uh, Apicolus, I think in Hebrew also, his actual name became uh, uh, you know, uh, synonymous with somebody who uh, goes against uh, mainstream or uh, does, uh, says things that are blasphemous. So here he says, where our own actions are autonomous and it is to them that praise and blame naturally attach. So he discovers this link between free will and moral accountability. Um, this was considered to be blasphemous. And I think in Jewish, Jewish uh, traditions, uh, this is, uh, um, they, they go against this. It's because it goes, of course, against all the concept of God. We are in charge, we are autonomous, we are free from gods and all that. Um, and then Democritus, it's like, can you imagine 2,500 years ago, somebody uh, says the first principles of the universe are atoms and empty space. Everything else is merely thought to exist. So both of them were trying to push back on gods, especially Greek gods, um, but really ahead of their time. I don't know what we did in the 2,500 years since, but uh, uh, already back then they had some um, notions. One of them is emphasizing free will exist in that you know, we decide our own, our own um, you know, decisions. Uh, but then uh, if we look at physics and atoms and empty space and how the universe works, it's very deterministic, so free will uh, doesn't really exist. Still debated 2,500 years later, we jump into this uh, neuroscience. So you can see uh, on the left side, free will is possible. So it's amazing to see neuroscientists and biologists kind of write about how uh, evolutionary we uh, developed the capacity for unpredictability. So we wanted to escape predators. So in order to be able to escape a predator that can predict your future uh, moves, you want to be unpredictable. So evolutionary mechanisms that allow for free will or unpredictability. Uh, but then we've got the Libet experiments. Perhaps you're familiar with these. 
Sam Harris, who's now a famous podcaster, our free will is just an illusion. Uh, if we go into our own field, so social psychology uh, is what I consider myself to be embedded in. So I did uh, an exchange during my PhD to the Baumeister lab. Uh, so I know Baumeister. Uh, some of the work that I uh, will talk about here is with Baumeister. So Baumeister has a very clear view. Uh, I was a bit shocked to see his headline over there here in Slate. Uh, do you really have free will? Of course. Here is how it evolved. So he takes the evolutionary perspective on free will, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, his unique perspective on that. On the other side, you've got free will is an illusion, obviously behavioralism, uh, behaviorism with uh, Skinner, uh, John Barge with priming, and since then we, we know that priming literature has a few issues, but at least he comes with the notion that you know context affects people beyond their free will. So we again have these, uh, the, this contrast between, between the two. If we put aside this debate, so 2,500 years, we haven't been able to uh, make much progress there. Uh, hopefully at some point we'll be able to determine whether free will exists or not, if, uh, if it's even a scientific um, uh, thing that we can uh, look at. But as social psychologists, uh, we um, try to shift the, the focus from whether free will exists or not to whether people believe the free will exists and how this affects their cognition and their behavior. So it seems like whether uh, somebody believes that something uh, is happening, whether there's a God, so whether there's free will, whether there's anything else, seems to affect all sorts of things. So I started in my PhD thesis to look at notions of belief in free will, both the cognition and the consequences. Um, I kind of joined and took a little bit uh, from this group. They call themselves the X-Files, so experimental philosophers. Uh, X-Files is short for that. Um, and they have this, uh, and they published in Science uh, the, a few papers introducing what experimental philosophy is. Basically, it's taking judgment, decision-making, and social psychology uh, methods in order to investigate philosophical notions like free will. So ask people, rather than telling people what is free will and uh, you know, how to think about free will, philosophers are shifting towards trying to just understand what do people think free will is? What do they uh, know about it? What do they want to say about it? How does this impact their lives? So a lot of interesting things that came out of this experimental philosophy group. Uh, if you ask people what is free will, it's a very loaded term. A lot of people have different definitions for what free will is. Uh, also agency. Um, I'm not sure that when you asked me to talk about agency, you, talk, uh, you were thinking about free will beliefs. So agency can go all sorts of different ways and people conceptualize this in different, um, using different constructs. Uh, for me, when I talk about free will, it's this very simplified uh, definition that was uh, done back then in Florida State. Philosophers met social psychologists, met economists, you know, they sat down together, uh, judgment decision making folks, and tried to get a, a definition that everybody would agree to. So uh, it seems like it's the capacity to perform free actions. It doesn't help us much, it still has this free in it. So, what is free actions? Uh, the acting agents could have chosen to do otherwise. Uh, in what sense? Um, so over there we have the differences between the deterministic view and the indeterministic view, but generally everybody seems to agree that at least you had alternative options, so you had a choice set, so this links us to judgment decision making. There is a choice set that is affected by all sorts of things, but you allegedly have a choice between these options. And it seems like there's the capacity to freely choose among those. Uh, what does it mean to freely choose? That you don't have external coercion, and external coercion could be social norms, but it could be things like angels, demons, gods, uh, and even the universe. So there's no coercion from external uh, resources, but there's also no internal coercion. What is an internal coercion? Uh, we consider things even like personality, genes, urges, needs, desires, all things that are beyond our control that are affecting us that we try to override are considered to be internal constraints to free will. Um, this, this is Alison over here. She joined our team not too long ago. And the reason why she joined us is because she was doing some research on free will and she conducted her uh, thesis or a systematic uh, review of the free will literature. And this is her summary 
uh, oops, the results, uh, the results show that for ordinary folk, uh, so for laypersons, for people who are not academics, especially the more educated population from the United States, free will is a dynamic construct centered on the ability to choose following one's goals and desires, uh, whilst being uncoerced and reasonably free from con constraints. So she, you know, we had this forum where we tried to agree on things. She summarized, systematically summarized the literature, and it's really interesting. And I think now it was submitted to Meta Psychology, so I really hope that she gets this uh, published. Um, I did my own review back in 2017. Uh, every time I try to submit a free will a related manuscript to journals, people are like, but free will is exactly like locus of control. Free will is exactly like uh, self-efficacy. Free will is exactly like implicit theories, mindsets, growth versus you know, essentialist uh, uh, views. So I had enough of this. So I decided I'm just going to explain how beliefs in free will uh, are different. So you can see that I'm comparing this to locus of control, self-efficacy, self-esteem, self-control, implicit theories, mind-body dualism, intentionality. And I'm clarifying that I think belief in free will is the most important agency construct because it really differentiates between what we have chosen to do rather than what is us. Because us, if you just look at locus of control, internal locus of control includes a lot of things that are beyond our control. So we don't choose our genes, our urges, needs, and desires, uh, but free will really gets at the point of uh, differentiating within the person what is agentic and what is not. So for me, uh, belief in free will is really gets to the heart of what agency uh, is all about. Uh, and now we're doing a, a, free, a free will agency constructs meta-analysis, and we're doing this as a registered report. So um, if you want, you're welcome to join us on this. This is currently our team, so you can see Allison over here. Adrian, I'll come back to you. He's done a few things on uh, belief in free will with me. And this team over here is from a meta-analysis workshop that I gave in Singapore. I um, can't remember, like two or three years ago. I get lost with time with all the COVID stuff. So yeah, like about three years ago, and we've had two uh, meta-analysis registry reports come out of that. So, um, so that, that's a team that you can definitely uh, join. Now, a lot of people ask, what is agency for? Why do we need agency? What is the purpose of agency? What do people think? Uh, free will is for. And we have two uh, basic uh, philosophical notions of what is, is it for. And I think most people, their intuition goes with the Dennett, the elbow room uh, uh, quote over here, free will is only worth having if it enables the individual to get what she or he wants. So when we feel about, you know, we think about free will, it's like, I want to do something, therefore I do it. Uh, interestingly, Baumeister comes from a, a different uh, perspective, so over here on the left, uh, and he comes up with this uh, interesting notion that actually free will is for following rules. Uh, so that seems a bit uh, paradoxical. Uh, you're talking about free wills, but you're trying to uh, follow the rules. Why is that? But in his, in his view, you choose to follow the rules. So all of us are animals. Uh, we, you know, descended from... Our uh, ancestors uh, definitely have more animalistic uh, uh, features about them. Uh, but then, you know, there are all sorts of things that we want. So uh, if I want, uh, you know, this laptop, I go over there and I grab it because this is my urge. I really want this laptop, therefore it's mine. So the animalistic uh, desires, the urges that we have uh, are to do all sorts, of thing, all sorts of things that are not social. But then comes willpower, self-control, our ability to exert this kind of power in order to overcome our urges and uh, desires in order to coexist with others in society. So we're not just animals, we're social animals, uh, and that allows us. Uh, so free will is for overcoming our selfish needs in order to coexist with others in society and uh, look long-term uh, for you know, long-term desirable uh, goals. Yeah. What is positive and what is negative? At the beginning, people were thinking, you know, belief in free will, how can this be a bad thing? Uh, you want people to have as much free will as possible. But I think every time somebody comes to you, even, you know, growth mindsets or implicit theories and everything, even self-efficacy, self-esteem in the 1960s, 70s, you know, we're thinking it's like there's only good things about this. Let's change society to have as much self-esteem as possible. Let's emphasize growth mindsets. 
But then if you do enough research, at some point somebody is going to come and say, okay, there's some downsides to this. And now we know with belief in free will, it's not all positives. So you can see on the left some of the things that we consider to be positive, like taking responsibility and coexisting with others in society, but also uh, for ourselves, you know, there's more motivation and performance. We're able to uh, link uh, our achievements to something that we've done. So there's all sorts of things about that. And I did some research on that. Um, I don't know why it's, uh, let's, okay, so less positive stuff is that uh, obviously if I uh, perceive to have more responsibility, if things don't go well, I have more guilt or more regret. Sometimes I, um, you know, attribute more free will to people who do not have free will. So if there's a homeless person uh, in the street, a uh, person who is high on belief in free will might go to the homeless person and say, get, get up and go find a job. It's up to you. You have free will. But it's not always the case. So there's all sorts of things about attributions that we now understand are, are kind of tricky with this uh, free will. And once again, this uh, uh, team over here uh, did a, a registered uh, report. This is already in principally ex accepted, a journal of research in personality. So we mapped all the things that uh, free will is, uh, free will beliefs are associated with. So pro-sociality, norm adherence, and then personal uh, stuff. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite a team. Uh, now they're coding everything. So once we get the in principle accept acceptance, then we start actually doing the whole thing which is uh, my, my cue to tell you that register reports is important and why you want to do register reports. So at the beginning, if you just imagine us doing this meta-analysis, going through all the search and the coding and everything, and finally trying to submit this to the journal, and the journal said, this is not, uh, you know, we didn't like your methods, or this is not uh, comprehensive enough, or you failed to do all sorts of things. But here, with this process, actually, we submit our uh, design. We just submit the meta-analysis plan to the journal. We get some amazing, constructive, positive feedback from reviewers. So they're not hostile anymore. They're not trying to judge us all the time. They're trying to help us. And then we amend it. And then finally, um, in, after the peer review stage one, they give you an in-principle acceptance, which means it doesn't matter what the results are this is gonna get published. So for early career researchers, uh, like Velvetina, she's a first year PhD student at UCL and, and Kevin over here last year, PhD student, uh, they can all already add this to their CV and it's a guaranteed publication. So they know, and this is before they've done any, any of the uh, data uh, search uh, coding. In stage two, the only thing that is happening in register reports is that they look that you followed your plan or you explain why you didn't, uh, so deviations from that. So this is briefly what register reports are about. If I am a PhD student or a master's student, I will only do uh, this. I think that's like the best investment that you, can, that you can do. Some people say it takes a long time to do register reports. The MPhil students that are working with me have completed register reports from beginning to end in less than a year. So it's, it's doable uh, even for students' ECRs. And I think increasingly we need to go up the evidence pyramid. So the status quo research, we have a lot of doubts about. Now that when I see a book about social psychology or anything, I have a lot of doubts of what replicates and what doesn't, uh, but we need to increasingly go towards exploratory open science where everything is shared or conformatory open science where things are pre-registered. Uh, but the, the height of everything is a register report and Chris Chambers who started a register report uh, says that the best evidence that we have hopefully in a decade or so will be a meta-analysis of register reports. I think that's not going far enough. So I added a few other layers. Uh, so I believe we need a register report meta-analysis of register reports, and we need to do this continuously uh, updating. If you want to hear from them, they actually have some YouTube videos. Uh, if you don't believe me that register reports is the way to go, uh, you can go and, and hear what they have to say. Also, Krishna, who was the lead author over there in Singapore, wrote all of this. He's an editor in JPSP, so I asked him, what do you think about register report? This is what he said. Uh, this was by far the most rewarding research experience that I've had. And this is a person who's been in academia for a while. I'm going to uh, uh, summarize this for you. So clarity, no second guessing, and reviewers are really constructive. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, hopefully you got a little bit of notion of what we're doing with meta-analysis. Uh, the, the next uh, slides are going to be experimental stuff that we've done. So actual judgment and decision-making experiments that we've conducted. So this kind of summarizes everything about the introduction of what free will is and how we map this 
uh, with outcomes and other agency constructs. So if you have other questions, I can take those now. Yeah, so the question was uh, coming from clinical psychology. Uh, a lot of the courses or therapy is about empowering free will and uh, a lot of disorders are perceived to be a loss of free will. Um, so are, are we doing anything with clinical psychologists and what's our take on this? So it's, it's really interesting because at home, uh, I grew up uh, with a clinical psychologist's father um, who keeps uh, challenging me on all these kind of things. And we actually, we gave a forum together in Poland of all places. We had a father-son symposium on clinical psychology talking about free will and I'm talking about kind of like the philosophical notions of that. And it's really, it's really interesting. So uh, when people ask you, so what is the truth? And um, I, I think it's, it's a good answer uh, to say that for some people under some circumstances, free will seems to be something good to believe in uh, because it can help you do all sorts of things. And it has some uh, positives that we're trying to uh, map right now. Uh, but obviously, and this is where we need to think about all sorts of things, psychologists also make some decisions on where uh, belief in free will might uh, lead to all sorts of problems. Uh, so it can facilitate some disorders. So if somebody you know, uh, believes in, in oneself and their free will as being superior to that of others or all sorts of other things, it, it could have all sorts of uh, challenges. I do think that it's very important for clinical psychology to start looking at this. Um, also into trying to really determine whether empowering free will is something that always leads to good and the expected behaviors or not. Uh, I think what I'm struggling with a little bit with my father, and I know that clinical psychology uh, is shifting, is that a lot of these things are kind of like uh, theory-based rather than empirical-based. So we have now clinical psychological science, and there's a bunch of journals that are trying to do empirical research, but we don't have enough uh, field experience uh, looking at these, uh, these notions. I do some very easy stuff, I have to admit. You know, I'm Turk, prolific uh, student, labs, and stuff like that. I'm really looking forward to working with people who are in the field in order to look at these, uh, these notions. That's something that I set for myself in the next two, three years to really start uh, looking at that. So once I map you know, 100 of these heuristics and bias, and once I map with a meta-analysis what is free will, I think that the next obvious step is going into the field and working with people and looking at you know, a real impact. But first, you know, lab setting is, and then working on that. But that's a really good question. So if anybody wants to do something on that, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really interested. So thank you for that. Any other, yes, please? Yeah, um, so the question is, um, so in study replications, uh, assuming that they're doing a direct replication, so what's the difference between taking the approach of registered reports compared to uh, somebody, let's say a JPSP doing one study and then eight other replications of uh, that work? So I have an, a very elaborate, long uh, answer for this. It's a semester course that I gave at University of Hong Kong, uh, and the last uh, Zoom semester is online, so <laughs> it's available on YouTube. Uh, very briefly, I will say, uh, we differentiate with, between two kinds of replications. Uh, one is a conceptual replication, which I think is very common in JPSP and stuff like that. So you've shown a phenomena, very small sample in a very specific context, and then you build on that and you do a conceptual so we basically um, focus on direct replications as close as possible, repeating exactly the same thing, plus adding an extension that doesn't harm the replication. So there are benefits to both of those. But let's say if something doesn't work well, um, uh, you, want to, uh, you want to know what went wrong. Is it the direct replication? Is it the extension? Uh, so if a conceptual replication doesn't work well, we don't know what happened. Plus in all these uh, journals, JPSP, at, at least until uh, a few years ago, uh, if you didn't uh, find anything and no, no findings, uh, first of all, they wouldn't publish this. And then people learn from that so they don't submit this. Um, so this is why it's very important, not just for one lab to replicate its own work um, and uh, you know, uh, find journals that also allow for 
null findings, but really have a collaboration of people from around the world that will repli replicate your work and also will allow you to see perhaps uh, uh, your bias in some way or your experimenters or this context. Is it just uh, Ben Gurion University or Israel or perhaps it will replicate? So it used to be very difficult to do this kind of thing, but nowadays we have amazing projects like Psychological Science Accelerator where you can bring in your own research and say, this is what I want uh, to research. And then 70 labs from around the world not asking you for any money, not asking you for anything, we'll replicate this for you, run this for you, so you can actually see that this is consistent, not just when you run this here at Ben Gurion or Prolific uh, uh, MTurk, but also in, in many contexts around the world, also allowing for some elaborate analysis of you know, culture, context, uh, and all that. But first of all, seeing like the phenomena itself, whether this is uh, reproduce, reproducible. Generally, we have, we have a lot of biases. I think if you're a judgment decision-making researcher, We've successfully replicated, I think one of the strongest effects is uh, hindsight bias, outcome bias, uh, confirmation bias. So we know all of this as judgment decision-making scholars that this is inherent, but we don't take this in cons consideration in the science process. Registered reports really allows you to um, get rid of all that. So there is no publication bias because everything is published. There is no hindsight bias because all the criticism needs to be done before data collection. So it really eliminates all the biases that we in judgment decision-making know is inherent uh, in the way that people evaluate all sorts of things. Uh, plus, uh, registered reports allows you to get constructive, positive criticism uh, to improve even from your uh, adversaries. So adversarial collaboration is classic for registered reports. So get the other lab that you know, has a different mindset and get together to decide on really what is the most rigorous method. So rather than focusing on the outcomes, what did we receive? We focus on really establishing the scientific, the best scientific way of looking at a theory, a hypothesis, uh, phenomena. So it's not just registered reports. I think now we're already moving. Perhaps those of you who are active on Twitter, uh, Niamh and, and others, uh, know that we're moving to a peer-reviewed community reviewed registry reports where you upload something as a preprint, the community together uh, uh, looks at this, and then once they agree, the community agrees that this is uh, good, uh, good research, then the uh, journals, and yesterday, Two days ago, Nature, Human Behavior, you know, Impact Factor 12 said, yes, we want this, uh, we're, we're joining this model. So uh, journals will bid, will come to you and say, we'll, we see that this was a peer, uh, peer reviewed by the community, we want to publish this. So moving to, towards preprints, moving towards community, uh, um, looking at things before data collection. And I think especially, you know, if we're looking at COVID and vaccines, what vaccine would you trust more? One that somebody, let's say, uh, I come from Hong Kong, so uh, Sinovac vaccine. So they've replicated this again and again, conceptually, maybe published this, all sorts of things. Or whether you open this up for the society in order to establish the criteria for which vaccines are to be trusted. So I think registered reports is the way, way to go. I hope that answers the question. So judgment, decision-making, and experimental philosophy uh, approach um, if you're familiar with judgment decision-making methods, this will not look uh, too uh, strange for you, but I think some other people, perhaps clinical psychologists, will look at this and like, what is this? Uh, but we give this kind of scenarios, uh, and this is a between design, so some people see the indeterministic universe, some people see the deterministic universe, and some people see an uncertain universe. So experimental, experimental philosophy asks participants to imagine a universe. It's not something concrete about, imagine you are in a situation you're familiar with, but just imagine a universe in which almost everything that happens is completely caused by whatever happened before it. The one exception is human decision-making. So you can already see judgment decision-making is inherent in the issues of free will. So everything is predetermined, but human, human judgment decision-making is separate from that. And a lot of people seem to uh, think that this is, um, you know, this is how we define free will. So I think all of us as scientists in the universities, we look at predictability, we look at models, we try to predict the future uh, in behavior and all that. Um, but some people say, but you know, humans have the capacity to act uh, not in accordance perhaps with the laws of the universe. Um, and then there's like one, one example over here. So uh, John decided to have French fries at lunch since uh, this person's decisions in this universe is not completely caused by what happened before it. 
Um, so he could have decided to have something different. So even if we have the most uh, superpower computer that knows all the laws of the universe, still when he analyzes John's uh, decision, he would not be able uh, to determine what John wants to have. And John could choose to do something that perhaps a supercomputer uh, would be surprised with. Uh, deterministic universe is just like every decision was completely caused by everything that happened before it. This is the classic paradigm in experimental philosophy. We added one more and we said, perhaps people are confused by this, so they don't know if this is uh, deterministic. In deterministic, perhaps people just say, we don't know. So we added another universe saying uncertain universe. Imagine a universe where people just don't know. And we wanted to know whether people, which one of those seems to be the most realistic. So you can look at these and think, what is this universe that we're in right now? Which one is the closest to that? Um, we published this, uh, I don't know, two, three years ago, looking at all sorts of things. But um, we, in the different universes, we asked, so how real is this? So how close is this to the universe that you're currently in? And what you can see, it's very interesting that people believe that the indeterministic universe, so-called free will universe, is the most realistic one. So if uh, we look at this one, so it's the, <clears throat> it's the first one where people are uh, separate from the deterministic uh, uh, laws of the universe, and then uh, much lower than that, the deterministic uh, universe. Uh, and so, so we thought perhaps the uncertain universe, people don't know, but that's somewhere in between. So people are not, don't only believe that they live in a universe <clears throat> that is indeterministic, but they are certain about that. <laughs> so they have no doubt about this, which is really interesting. And then the, comes the question is like, why do people uh, believe in free will, like what does this facilitate? So we looked at happiness, learning, meaningfulness, uniqueness, pro-sociality, future um, res uh, responsibility. And you can see it's very, very consistent <clears throat> in that people believe that the indeterministic universe is a happier one, uh, easier to learn, it's more meaningful, you're more unique, uh, allows for more pro-social behavior and, and so forth. So you can see free will is associated with all sorts of things and we can gain some insights on that using something as simplistic as a, you know, imagining a universe where you know, something happens with the John and French fries. And we can get some insights about you know, how people uh, feel, uh, perceive uh, free will. Um, linking this to like why as a society, we now believe in free will. It wasn't always the case. It used to be a feudal or a very uh, strict religious environment where free will was not uh, respected or uh, promoted. Uh, the very cynical uh, Nietzsche view on this is that men were considered free only so that they might be judged and punished. So uh, his view of free will is very cynical and he makes this connection between free will and moral responsibility. The reason why we invented free will is that we can hold people accountable because if there's no free will, how do you uh, hold somebody? How do you judge them? How do you put them in jail? It's not their fault. You know, their genes caused this or society caused, or God caused this. How do you hold somebody accountable for that? Um, growing up in Israel, um, religious uh, studies, uh, Bi Akiva, and so now, uh, What's, what's the, like all is foreseen, but the permission is granted. Reshut Netuna. Akol Tzafui Reshut Netuna. Thank you. So um, very paradoxical. As a kid, I really didn't understand what this means. So if everything is foreseeable, how is it that uh, you know, free will is granted? Uh, God knows everything. So that's a bit paradoxical. So Nietzsche kind of looks at this, and, and this ties to you know, if, if there is free will, it allows for more responsibility, accountability, moral um, stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop here and come back to a question. Do you want to ask your question now? I think I've set up the, the thing for free will. Nachshon? Are you, you're referring to me? Yes, hi. Uh, I really enjoy the talk. I really also enjoy the ideological part about replicability. Uh, uh, but that's a side issue. I have two questions. Uh, regarding uh, free will, uh, uh, one is the believing in one own free will as opposed to others' free will. Uh, and that's quite important because uh, at least in some cases, I would like others to be predictable and would like myself to have free will. 
So is this an issue that you looked into? And uh, the other question I have, will you be able to remember the two questions or should I uh, give I, them I serially? I can just say that I have slides coming up about the first question. Ah, uh, great. And, 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 the second, and the second question concerns my uh, field of study, which uh, one of my fields of study, which is executive functions. And the uh, executive functions uh, allow you to exercise free will in the narrow sense. Uh, that is to be able to be free from hunches and urges and so forth. Um, uh, and they are highly heritable. They, we know individual differences in executive functions are above 90% heritable in, across several studies. Uh, and uh, maybe some people don't have a belief in free will because they don't have free will. That is, they have poor executive functions. And for them is the reason this is related to their poor functioning is not because of their lack of belief in free will. Is the uh, lack of belief in free will is realistic. It's their poor executive functions. We know that executive functions are uh, predicting a lot of bad outcomes in the world ranging from everything to everything, more or less. Uh, so that's my second question. I mean, sh instead of dealing with the symptom, maybe we should deal with the real phenomenon. Uh, well, I, here, I'm, the belief in free will could be a symptom. That's what I'm saying. Yes, uh, very, very good point. Uh, I think we're, we've been trying to tackle these things in order to try and understand you know, even demographics, uh, do people who come from lower social status or people who are um, disabled or people who are, you know, more fortunate uh, uh, circumstances or perhaps with less executive uh, functions have a lower belief in free will. And what's amazing about uh, free will, at least in our society, is that in almost any context when we run these surveys, is that how much do you believe in free will? And let's say there's a scale between one and 10. We rarely get anything lower than six, and it doesn't matter what your uh, background is. So it seems like, at least right now, in society, uh, free will belief is very, very common, uh, even for those who are less fortunate. And, and that doesn't seem to be a very strong predictor. Of course, there's a correlation. You know, we see something like 0 0.15, 0 0.2 of a correlation, but it's not what you would expect. It's like people who are completely without executive uh, functions do not perceive themselves to have uh, free will. And I think that leads to the uh, kind of the perception that perhaps free will, at least to some extent, is an illusion. So even if we don't have free will, it doesn't matter what we have. Uh, it's more about whether we believe in and we create this notion of free will in order to justify things or think, think of ourselves more favorably and other things uh, like that. So uh, I think we can look at both of these factors, whether people really have free will. So uh, they're internal, I think, in executive uh, function or external constraints, and we can measure these constraints. Uh, but we also, and I think this is the more social psychology judgment, decision-making, experimental philosophy take, is that regardless of all of that, looking at belief in free will, and then also looking at whether there's an alignment between uh, the, the actual, you know, objective so-called uh, perception of free will, whether they have free will or not, or whether they perceive themselves to be. Uh, and, and all these things, you know, from the first question, this misalignment between self and others, I'm going to come back to this, but... This just goes to show that free will is not really about whether you actually have free will. It's more about the biases, the, the rationalization, the things that you uh, lead yourself to believe in in order to allow for certain things in your life to happen. So I'll, I'll, I'll show a little bit more about, um, about that in the upcoming slides. Uh, I think I have enough time. Um, just to, to say something about Nietzsche over here is that morality uh, really seems to define the essential uh, self. I added this one project, even though it's not about free will, about the uh, essential self. So this is a classic um, by uh, Nina and Sean over here. So experimental philosophers meets uh, business school. And they were looking at um, all sorts of, uh, so what is it that if we take it out, people don't perceive the person to be the same anymore? So let's say that there is brain surgery and after the brain surgery, somebody lost their uh, morality or somebody uh, you know, is more apathic or something, you know, something is lost. Do we still consider the person to be the same person? So that is what we call the essential self. And it's really interesting 
what is the most important thing that if we take it away and if people don't have that anymore, we say this, it's not the same person anymore. And uh, the original findings are that morality seems to be uh, the most important thing to the essential self. So if a person changed their uh, perception of morality, what they emphasize in their morality, then we say it's not the same person, this brain surgery did something to them. I was really curious. So this is uh, an opportunity for me to show you what a replication and extension project looks like. Uh, so I decided I'm going to uh, do this with one of my thesis students. Uh, so you can see over here, Samson uh, did this. And, and basically what you can see, it's a little bit small, so I don't know if you can follow this, but uh, we found strong support for the uh, superiority of morality among the five conditions. Uh, we also find strong support for the utmost significance of moral traits. So definitely one of the strongest replications that we've had, uh, even though we've uh, looked at this in, 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 different, in different sample uh, many years later after the, the original. But I also really like uh, that Samsung decided to add uh, other uh, things. So we said, can we beat morality? Is there something more than morality that we can have? Uh, Samsung uh, thought that re religion is going to be stronger than morality, but you can see religion is actually compared to morality is lower than that. Uh, I thought maybe ideology, so political ideology, if somebody changes from a conservative to a liberal, we say it's not the same person anymore, but that doesn't even come close <clears throat> to morality. So there seems to be something about morality that is really essential uh, to the self. Uh, you can see kind of how we summarize replications and extensions. So first we look at the replications and we summarize this. Is there a signal or not a signal? Um, sometimes people, when they look at replications, they say in replications, usually they find weaker effects, but sometimes we found stronger effects. Actually, a lot of these findings, if you can, if you know what a Cohen's D is, so a Cohen's D of 1.41, 1.36. These are very, very strong effects. Cohen used to say that uh, 0 0.8 is a strong effect. So, uh, you know, this is almost double, double that. So we found very strong support, sometimes exceeding the replication, uh, but we also added an extension uh, and found some really interesting uh, stuff in that. So this is just like one example of um, us finding support for something like the essential moral self which goes to show that if morality is so important and free will is linked to morality, then perhaps free will also is a very important notion uh, to people. How to link uh, free will beliefs and decision-making. So we come to the bias blind spot. This is one of the replication projects that we've done. So uh, bias blind spot is a fascinating um, phenomena. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, when, when you think about it, it's like, uh, people, uh, the actual, um, you know, so perceiving bias in people, so people believe that they're less biased than others, even if you actually show them that they're as biased or more biased uh, than others. So this one from uh, Proning, uh, we try to do a replication. Um, basically what it says is that people uh, are easier to notice biases in others rather than in themselves. And then they rate their own biases as being lower than that of other people. And the re remarkable thing is that even when we tell people there is something like a bias uh, blind spot phenomena, and then they ask them, did you rate yourself accurately in the previous question where we asked you about biases? And they say, yes, we did. So even when you tell people about bias blind spot, uh, it's very difficult to reduce this bias blind spot. And I think um, you know, when we look at uh, open science replication crisis and all this, we always see biases in, in other people, so in our reviewers, in uh, people that can do that. Um, so we replicated uh, this whole thing, a very successful replication, but we also added uh, whether this is associated with belief in free will. So there is some association between uh, belief in free will and personal shortcomings in oneself. So people are per perceive themselves to be, to have less uh, shortcomings uh, if the stronger the, the free will, the lower the, uh, they perceive themselves to have personal shortcomings, uh, which enhances the bias blind spot in the differences between self and other. So it seems to affect uh, our perception of ourselves and the perception of others in a different way uh, that might lead to uh, bigger biases if we believe more strongly in belief in free will. So even if belief in free will is generally assumed to be something that's general for, you know, we see, we see human beings 
as having free will. There is a differentiation between how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive others. And belief in free will seems to be uh, further enhanced when we look at ourselves. Um, okay, so that's another uh, judgment, classic judgment and decision-making um, study that we've done. Um, I usually present this uh, Kahneman and Milo in 1986 in norm theory uh, presented exceptionality bias, exceptionality effect. Uh, so if you have uh, George and Paul, um, George uh, never takes hitchhikers and Paul always takes hitchhikers. And then um, one day, both of them take a hitchhiker and, and get robbed. So which one of those uh, feels higher regret? Norm theory, 3,000 citations, one of the you know, most uh, robust. We've tested this from every angle. It's amazing to see uh, these findings uh, replicated. So we saw exceptionality uh, bias, and we wanted to replicate this. So one of, no, this is the first replication that I ever ran in 2017. And Lucas over here was a master student, so we wanted to replicate this exceptionality bias. So he came to me and he said, you know, this hitchhiker scenario or a car accident scenario or a robbery scenario, uh, I want to replicate this. Uh, but in the second one, in Miller and McFarlane, Rather than looking at regret, at regret, which is what uh, the original norm theory is about, they looked at compensation. So Lucas asked me, uh, this compensation doesn't make a lot of sense because it includes a lot of other things. So the question over there was, uh, this person got robbed in the store that he either frequents or doesn't frequent, how much compensation would give to the, to the person. So it involves a lot more than just regret. And when we ran this, actually, we uh, saw that the first one replicated with regret, but the compensation DV did not replicate. But in an extension, uh, Lucas decided to add on the second page another question about regret. And this was extended. This was, uh, uh, so if you do an extension that's closer to the original, closer to the theory, it could be that you have some interesting insights. And when we uh, contacted people who have done norm theory exceptionality uh, bias uh, research, and we asked them, you know, we, didn't, we couldn't get the compensation DV to work, but we got the measure of regret to work. And people said, yes, we submitted this to the journal. And they said, but you know, somebody already showed that this works, so we don't need to update this anymore. And then the researcher said, yeah, we also ran compensation and couldn't find support for that. So 1986 until Lucas Kutcher in 2017, people have tried again and again to do uh, compensation when actually what they should have uh, looked at is regret, which is closer to the theory. Or we also ran a meta-analysis uh, on this, and we found that uh, regret uh, effect size is about double of that of compensation, so you need at least uh, better powered samples. Um, just so you know about, uh, um, you know, some people approached us before we collected the data and asked us if we were willing to submit this to cognition and emotion. Lucas was at the beginning very enthusiastic and I told him to calm down, it's, uh, there's nothing uh, to, uh, to, to be too enthusiastic about, but it's amazing that they lived up to it and uh, Lucas got this, uh, you know, cognition and emotion. So, stuff that we've done in exceptionality effect. The reason why I'm saying this is that another uh, extension that Lucas added was about free will. So which one is associated with more free will? Is it exceptionality or is it routine? Um, might seem obvious to you. <laughs> uh, this is the meta-analysis that he did. So you can see the effect size uh, you know, is much higher for regret. And this you know, Adrian that I talked about from the meta-analysis team. So this is also in uh, cognition and emotion. And you can hear Adrian talk about uh, why, how he joined uh, us. So uh, after running his first experiment about the association between exceptionality effect and free will, uh, he discovered that I'm also working on this. And I did this with Lucas. So he contacted me and said, uh, can we join forces? And of course we can. First of all, I share everything that I do. Uh, on the open science framework. So I said, you can just take it as is, but he uh, um, suggested uh, co-authorship. And then finally we worked on this together. And what you can see over here is that exceptionality affecting agency. So exceptional choices are attributed higher free will than routine, which is an interesting take on this uh, to something from 1986. So you can make an association between an, a classic bias like norm theory, exceptionality, uh, a lot of findings over here. It doesn't always work, and the effect is not as strong as we uh, expected. But already here, you can see we measured free will, we measured moral responsibility, and we measured regret. Uh, and in some of them, we found, so in two out of three scenarios, we found free will to be uh, stronger for exceptionality. 
but not in all scenarios. Uh, so we're also trying to dis disentangle uh, at when does exceptionality lead to stronger attributions uh, of free will. We ran additional studies. We found very uh, similar results and so forth. This I'm going to skip, the side effect effect. Uh, I'm just going to uh, say, uh, not going over this, uh, but uh, you're able to go and read this as a preprint. And the first author uh, is uh, decided to, he's got a lot of, uh, he's on the job market. Uh, I hope he will make it to academia, but it's hard to tell with the job market right now. I just want to say first author is available to you. We have data. Everything is ready. Uh, you can come in and take the lead on this together with Adrian and myself. Uh, this is uh, the data. So we make the connection between beliefs uh, in free will, uh, free will attributions and the side effect effect, which is one of the strongest findings in experimental philosophy. We're also running a lot of registry reports, stage one. And I'm showing this to you because here again, you have the... <laughs> Um, you can come in and take the lead on this. So these are completed, written, registered reports, stage one. You can be the lead author, uh, work together with the students, one of my MPhil students and me at the end. So you can uh, go have a look at this preprint if it uh, lives up to your standards or you think this is interesting. Let's submit this together as a registered report. Um, we're also uh, doing uh, this, uh, this right now. Uh, this is actually uh, not a registry report, but I'm completing data collection right now with a, a student of mine and a, um, a master's student. So uh, we'll complete this at the end of the week, but this again is open for you to take lead on. So you're very welcome. If there's something that, you, uh, that interests you about agency, mind perception, the nature of uh, objectification, uh, so there's a stimuli of somebody who's uh, nude or somebody who has, uh, um, uh, so whether people attribute lower mind to somebody who is uh, naked uh, and so So really interesting stuff over there. Um, I go with what my students want to do replications on. So I'm really eager to see how this is going to pan out. And we added an extension regarding free will. Um, so that's something to look into. Just to summarize this whole thing. Uh, everything that we've talked about, I've jumped around between different uh, topics. Uh, free will is a core concept in agency. To me, this is one of the most important ones. Uh, you can use classic judgment decision making or social psychology methodology to look into this. And this is you know, some of the experimental philosophy stuff is based on this. Uh, we look at free will beliefs and attributions as linked to judgment and decision making phenomena, classic heuristics and biases. Uh, more importantly, I went over things very fast. Everything is open. Everything is available. Everything is preprints on my website. You can go and have a look. If you can't find something, just contact me and let me know. And especially if you're an early career researcher starting from you know, undergraduate, MPhil, a PhD postdoc, please come join us. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for you, many projects for you to take the lead, uh, do science, you know, register reports, uh, I believe, the right way. Um, this is the summary slide, so you can scan this or go on my website. Everything that I do is on this website. I try to be as transparent as possible from the beginning. You know, when I have an idea, I put this up there. If there's a preprint, I put it out there. If there's uh, an update from a journal, I put it up there. I'm very active on Twitter. This is how Niv and I met um, and got talking about things, so you can follow me. I do a lot of things about open science, meta science. There's also a mailing list, so if you want to know about my workshops, I give workshops almost every month. Uh, I give talks. Um, uh, some people who want me to come in and do um, workshops on meta-analysis or re pre-registrations, register reports. Um, so sometimes you can join some of that, if it's, especially if it's on Zoom. So mailing list will allow you to, um, to get updates on that. Uh, everything that I can, which is on Zoom, I try and upload to YouTube. Uh, so you can follow some of the uh, playlists over there in order to get updates about workshops or talks. Also, everything that I taught in the last uh, semester on Zoom is up there. And of course, if you want to talk to me about everything from judgment decision making to open science uh, up until uh, joining Maastricht University. So this is up for you to uh, use at any time. And if needed, we can do follow ups uh, on video or even when I'm in Israel in person. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Very happy to meet all of you. I'm going to stay here uh, for the rest of the day, going around your beautiful campus. So if you want to come talk to me afterwards, uh, I'm happy to. Thank you. 
Um, can I ask a question? Uh, you... oh. Yeah, if, if you want, you're free to leave. You are always free to leave. <laughs> we, we have free will. Uh, but if you want to stay, I'm going to stay here and answer for as long as people have questions. Can I ask a follow-up question to Nakhshan? I don't sure. know if there's a question. Um, so um, Nakhshan asked, um, what is the relation between uh, having some um, level of free will to uh, believing in free will, whether it's, uh, um, whether it's uh, what's the cause, what's the effect, I think maybe there are even compensation mechanisms that you can think about that sometimes uh, maybe being uh, in a situation where you have less of uh, freedom might uh, compensate uh, to it by uh, relying more on the uh, belief in free will uh, if, if the two are uh, interchangeable in terms of the uh, consequences. But uh, uh, um, what about people who are, uh, okay, not disadvantaged in terms of... Uh, of, uh, I don't know, uh, money or a class, but actually uh, uh, limited in their free will by addiction or by, uh, or by uh, any sort of physical uh, impairments. Do you have any data whether they still retain, uh, whether, whether addiction, for example, uh, reduces people's beliefs in free will, increases this, or doesn't change it? Yeah, good, good question. Um, from the Baumeister lab that I uh, visited and worked in uh, Free Will, I know the Baumeister and his lab have a few um, uh, papers on this. Um, so, yeah, there's Andy in New Zealand that, that did some stuff on addiction. So, obviously, addiction is considered to be a loss of, of free will um, and uh, very difficult to people who are, are in addiction to see themselves as being able to do anything regarding the one thing that they're addicted to. Um, maybe they have all sorts of ways to rationalize what is going on to perceive themselves as having free will despite addiction. But definitely an addiction is such a strong thing, also like a disability is such a strong thing that obviously it has to affect the way that you perceive yourself, yourself to having free will. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it doesn't eliminate it. And even if it reduces it, it doesn't reduce it to the extent that it's much lower. Uh, so it's still on the very high range of people still believing that they have free will. I'll give you like the most remarkable paper that I know from uh, Gray and Wagner. Uh, is that um, when we ask people uh, whether they believe uh, people who are um, in a coma, you know. Uh, so three categories, live persons, people in a coma, and people who are dead. Who has the, the strongest uh, free will in attributions? And you would expect, you know, people who are dead to have uh, the least free will. But the amazing thing about the way that people answered this is that people believe uh, that uh, dead people have more free will than people who are in a coma because people who are dead went into the afterlife and, you know, God uh, is helping them do whatever afterwards. So uh, they believe that a person in a coma who is in a status where they're not alive but they're not dead has the least free will. So a lot of very intriguing ways to think about uh, free will. You can't think of a, a bigger disability than being dead. But even when we think about being, you know, people being dead, it's like we have all sorts of other things that come and interact with these things like religious beliefs, like, uh, you know, the way that we perceive ourselves as free agents in this world, even though we have very little ability to affect outcomes. Uh, so we still need to map out these heuristics and biases about the way that people believe uh, uh, free will, they believe about the mind. It's not necessarily the case that being uh, disabled, having an addiction or having you know, lower uh, mental capacity, executive functions would lead to a loss of uh, perception of free will. I think it depends on all sorts of things, but the, the there is obviously an effect to, to what extent, what the effect sizes are. I don't remember, but if you'll email me, I can send you some links to some really interesting literature uh, on that. But there's lots of room for people to come in. Uh, social psychology, judgment, decision-making, experimental philosophy, clinical psychology, to, to look at these things uh, even further. And, uh, and I think free will is such uh, an important core notion in people's lives, together with morality, together with the mind. Um, 
that it's really it's worthwhile looking at this uh, more in depth than we have so far. Agency is important in our in, in our experience of of the universe, in our experience of our lives, of ourselves. Okay, so so the question is about this slide. If uh, so, the differences between these three universes, you were convinced by most of us, but the one thing that you found a little bit strange is the learning uh, column. Why is free will uh, important for learning, or what is the question that led people to answer? Uh, in such a way, and I think, I can't remember the actual sentence, but it was like, which one of these universes facilitates, um, uh, allows for more learning from own uh, mistakes? Um, so I think that also hints at the, so I think the basic, the basic understanding is, is if everything is deterministic and you've made a mistake, it's not your fault and then you just let go and you go with the flow so next time something happens and you either make a mistake or you don't make a mistake it's not uh, up to you to learn from but if there is the perception of free will and i think that also relates to clinical psychology and empowering patients it's like if you take charge if you look at things that you've done and you believe that you are the one that uh, led to that and it led to a mistake then you can change that then you can take a different path and then next time uh, it allows for a change in behavior that perhaps will lead to a more positive outcome. So learning from own mistakes, you do need the sense of responsibility uh, as, as part of that. Uh, I think learning from a deterministic universe in the way that you were looking at this is like if we're looking at, you know, we want to predict in the future. So you, you're making an association with unpredictability. If you want to learn, we want to have more predictability. If we do this, then something will happen. Uh, and there's definitely some of that, perhaps if you would frame this in a slightly different uh, way. Um, but I think uh, here we're, we're kind of like past looking at learning from our own mistakes rather than trying to predict uh, the future. But it could be that if we're looking, uh, although we, we do have a question about the future, <laughs> I can't really, it's like the one almost on the right side. Um, and I can't remember exactly what that was about, but also like future uh, wise, we also found uh, free will to facilitate more of future direction. So I can't exactly remember about this, but I do agree that uh, predict predictability is much stronger in a deterministic uh, universe. The question is whether you have some role in this, whether you uh, have the capacity like a supercomputer uh, to predict that, to use that power in the deterministic universe in order to know what will happen to you or what each one of these options would lead to. Uh, ideally, if we would have at some point this kind of supercomputer and it will be available to all of us, perhaps this would be different. So actually, if I would be an experimental philosopher. I would tell you, excellent, let's just write another vignette, run this again, and then see what happens. Really interesting stuff. So if you like these kinds of games, the experimental philosophy, there's lots of, it's very easy to, you know, you, you, come, you come down with a few uh, scenarios. If you want, you submit this as a register report, but you can also just like go on uh, MTurk and within an hour or two, uh, get get some results after you pre-register for, of course. But uh, very easy to test these things, which is why, uh, and I think there's lots of room for you to, if there's something here that doesn't make sense to you, or you think that if you change the scenario or the DV, the question in some way, you'll get an additional insights. The experimental philosophy movement is really growing very fast, and there's lots of things that you can come in in order to contribute. Good point. Okay, great, thank you.